Hey, good morning, RCC. It is so great to see all of you today, those in the house, those in the room. It is a great day to be in God's house. Amen. 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 Let's stand today. We're going to praise the Lord. We're going to sing of his goodness in our lives. We want to invite you to sing along with us.
Amen, amen. Hey, well, church, go ahead and have a seat. And we are so glad you're here. We want to know you're here. In the front, in the seat back in front of you, you'll see a card there, a connect card. And we'd love for you to just fill that out. It even has a little QR code there. You can scan that. And you can drop it in the giving boxes on your way out. we just love to know you're here. Also on that same card, you can request prayer. And our church, our team, we come together every week and we pray for the needs of our church. And we love an opportunity to be praying for you in whatever season that you're walking through. And then finally today, we have an opportunity to give. And if you've come prepared to do that, thank you so much for your generosity in that. We have several ways to give. We have uh, riverchristian.church slash give. You can mail, you can text, you can give in person here at the giving boxes in the back. But however you do so, thank you so much for your generosity. Hey, today we are excited to highlight our student ministry, and we have Pastor Travis here who's going to do that for us. So Travis. Thanks, Ty. Hey, I want to tell you a little bit about student ministry. So our goal, the thing that we love to do is create a faith in students that lasts them their whole life. We want them to fall in love with Jesus while they're here and develop a relationship with him that lasts long uh, past here, you know, that overruns in, into the rest of their lives. So we do that in a couple of different ways. One, one of the things that I say to the students all the time is we want your best friends to be God's friend. Um, so we feel like if they can put those markers down right now and say, yes, I, I want everyone around me to be God's friend, then I think that that's so helpful in developing the character and the identity and, and who they are and who they're going to be. So um, we provide a great program, five to seven on Sundays, called REACH, which is a great place for our students to, to come together and, and form those godly friendships. So we would love uh, students for you to come to that REACH from five to seven. And uh, one of the other things that, that we really try to do is uh, put our students around uh, godly men and women who are showing them what it looks like to be an adult who loves the Lord and follows him and everything they do. So um, we, small group leaders have a huge place in our program. We want them to be pouring in the lives of our students and I can see the fruit of that as I uh, watch those small group leaders um, receive hard questions from their students, uh, love their students through, through them and then just cheer them on and build them up week in and week out. So uh, we love that we are surrounding our students with godly men and women that are showing them what it looks like to follow the Lord in their life. So students, uh, let me speak directly to you for a second. I know that trying something new is hard, and I know that trying something again is hard. But if you're not plugged in, my challenge to you is to, to give it a shot. Come Sundays 5 to 7 and uh, be a part of our program. So I want to tell you about a couple of extra things that we've got coming up. Uh, one Sunday a month, we do an event called Extended Reach. Uh, our Sunday program is called Reach, and this one runs a little bit longer. It's called Extended Reach. It happens once a month. This one is next week. There's always a theme. It's supposed to be our outreach night. It gives our students the opportunity to invite friends. So this, this one is themed as Redneck Night. Um, so we want all of our students to come and put on their Giddy Up, Get Up. Yeah, you like that. And uh, have a great time with us. And that's next Sunday, uh, the 24th. So we're going to wear those outfits to the fall festival. We'll be providing pizza uh, for them. And then we'll have that extended reach night right after. We also have winter retreats uh, coming up in January and February for uh, both our middle school and high school programs. So you can sign up for those on the website, the student tab of the website. And this morning, we have um, at our student table, which is right under the big TV, we've got a box to, uh, to participate in college care packages. If you'd like to donate uh, funds or write a card, it'll be out there for the next couple of weeks. We just want to um, wish our college students that are away from here well and let them know that we love them, we're proud of them. Um, so if you want to participate in that, there's a box um, at the student table. So there is a lot more than that going on. You can find all that information on the website. Uh, click the students, students tab of the website, and uh, if you have any questions about our student ministry, I will be at the uh, student table under the big TV after services. Thank you all so much. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Travis. Our student ministry is rocking here at RCC, so if you have not been a part of it or have student involved, you need to do that. Hey, we're going to sing a new song. Actually, we've been singing this song. It's a new song, but we're going to continue singing it. And this is a song called Speak to the Mountains. And it's basically just a song of victory over any season of our lives. Whatever you may be walking through, I don't know what you have walked into this place with, be it health, uh, relational, uh, maybe you're struggling with depression, maybe you're struggling with just figuring out 
how God is leading you in your life, this is a song that speaks to you. God is bigger, he's greater than all of those things. And the eternal glory that we get to share with Christ outweighs anything that we can experience in this life. Amen, church. Amen. So I'm going to invite us to stand, uh, stand this morning, and we're going to sing together. But let's let this be more than just a song that we sing, lyrics on a screen. Let's sing this as a prayer. Let's declare this as truth, and let's worship this morning. Giants keep calling my name. My God is so much bigger than troubles I face. Why would I hunger for power or riches or fame? My God is so
Can we give God the praise again? Give him again just a praise. Awesome being together. And welcome all our brothers and sisters right now online. Welcome everyone right now online, everyone around the world. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We love you guys. 
Have a seat, please. Have a seat. We're so grateful to have you here this morning with us at RCC. And now's the time of communion. And if you have that cup, and it's got the fruit of the vine there, along with the bread inside of it, we'd love for you to take that out. If you don't, it's out there in the breezeways. You can head out, and you can find it right now in the breezeways and, and get it for yourself. But we're going to time of communion, and we're going to reflect on a song that's really meant a lot to me as I go to a time of communion called Jesus Paid It All. I grew up with the hymns. Raise your hand if you grew up with the hymns. Raise your hand if you grew up with the hymns, all right? Some of you guys are like, what did he just say, hymns? How about, what, how about hers? I mean, what, what, and so you don't know what a hymn is, all right? But this song called Jesus Paid It All uh, was something I, I grew up with. And it was like probably a couple of decades. I never heard it again until I was in West Virginia at a, uh, on a service trip with a whole bunch of teenagers. And someone sung the song, and it just cut me to my core. And every time I come to a moment of communion, a lot of times I reflect on a song. And I just want you to reflect on it. We're about to, we're about to sing it together. And here's what it starts off. It, it says, I hear the Savior say, and that means Jesus is talking to you. Thy strength indeed is small. Like Nathan, your strength is small. Child of weakness, what you need to do is watch and pray and find in me, Jesus says, thine all in all. You'll find in Jesus that he really is our all in all. And then the second verse, we reply back to Jesus and it says this, Lord, now, now indeed I find, I didn't before but now I get it, thy power and thine alone can change a leper spot, can change my spots and melt this heart of stone. And I don't know if you feel like your heart is just feeling like it's a stone right now. And I totally get that, but I want you to know something. God's power through Jesus can melt that heart of stone. Amen? And well, how is that? Well, here it is. Because Jesus paid it all. And all to him, I owe. Sin left a crimson stain, church. But guess what? Through the blood of Jesus, he washed it white as snow. Amen? As we take this bread and we drink this cup, let's be reminded of that truth that Jesus covers over all sin. Not just the sin from your past, the sin right now, but the sin in the future for all time. He covers not just some of it or most of it. He covers all of it. He separates your sin as far as the east is from the west, and he throws it at the depths of the sea, and he resurrects a no fishing sign. All right? You can't get that sin out anymore. That sin's gone. It's covered. You are white as snow. Not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done for you on the cross. Amen. He paid it all. So let's reflect on that as we take this bread and we drink this cup right now. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you so much that you would love us enough to send us your son to die for us and to pay for all sin for all time. And Lord, we thank you that that you would come for such wretched people like myself, such weak people like myself, and Lord, you would change us. You would melt our heart of stone through the cross, through the love that poured out through your son's sacrifice. And so, Lord, as we take this bread and we drink this cup and we hear this song over us, may we be reminded and may it pierce our souls that our sin Every drop of sin for all time is gone forever and ever and ever. Lord, thank you so much for the blood of Jesus being that potent and that amazing. Lord, may we dance in that. May we find joy in that. May we find contentment only in Jesus because he truly is our all in all. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. And everyone said.
church. Can we give God the praise? Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I want to say to you, if you're a first-time guest, we are honored to have you here this morning with us at RCC. And we got a, a, a present for you we want to give to you. So please go out to the Welcome Center and get one of these. People are uh, fighting over these things, by the way. And we'll give them to you for free. You can get one. It's got some goodies in it. So make sure you pick that up at the Welcome Center after we're done today. You know, what's been amazing is watching God move in a powerful way. Uh, this whole, uh, basically, our It Is Written series. And today we come to the very end of our time, the Old Testament. And uh, some people are like, well, praise the Lord for that, all right? So we get to the greatest story of all, and we start talking about Jesus Christ next week. I want to tell you uh, about a man who went to the doctor for an annual physical. And he went there, not, not thinking much was going to happen, but the doctor came back to him and said, hey, um, I got some bad news. Uh, you've, only got, you've only got 10 months to live. And the man was just dumbfounded. He's like, what do you mean only got 10 months to live? He said, yeah, you have a terminal disease and you only have 10 months to live. And, and the man looked at him and said, trying to let that kind of sink in. He said, so what, doc, what can I do? What kind of technology, what kind of medicines out there that I can do to live longer? And the doc kind of shook his head and he kind of looked at him and said, actually, you can do one thing. You can uh, go out to the country and buy yourself a pig farm. Buy yourself a pig farm out in the country, and then uh, go find a widow with 14 children and marry her and bring all those children with you to the pig farm to live with you out there. And the man looked at him like, and that's going to make me live longer? He says, no, actually it won't, but it'll be the longest 10 months of your life, all right? <laughs> so, so, so 10 months, I mean, think about 10 months. How has your life gone for the last 10 months? Think about that. Since, since we started January 1st, how, is, how has 10 months gone for you last, last, last this past year? I want to fast forward. What do you think the next 10 months have in store for you? What do you think the next 10 months, especially your joy level? Let me think about that. Just your joy level, what's that going to be like over the next 10 months? Let me tell you about the last 10 months we've had here at RCC. Amazing things have happened. I think about we've had over 200 kids show up in our kids' ministry every single Sunday over the last 10 months. I think that's pretty great right there. That's pretty awesome. 200 kids. RCC Kids' Ministry. I think about Food and Friends, which launched a few months ago, and, and we had like 35. We were averaging and just, just a couple weeks ago. We had almost 50 people there from our community being fed right here in our atrium on Thursday night. That's pretty awesome. That's growing right now. I, I, this one right here is pretty cool. And the fact that uh, uh, before COVID, we had, we had almost 900 people for COVID, which is just incredible. Well, guess what? We're already back that number on campus. And that, that doesn't include all the people online. We have almost not, over 900 people showing up every single week on campus here at RCC. And let me tell you right now, that's unheard of. That's unheard of for people to be back to their normal numbers. But this is the one that gets me. This is the one I'm so thankful for. And that is we've already had 60 baptisms this year in 2021 over the last 10 months. 60 baptisms. That's pretty awesome. In fact, if you haven't made that move, I want to encourage you right now. We're going to have a baptism Sunday on November 28th. That is Thanksgiving week right there. And I can't think of a better day, you know, time to give praise to God for baptisms is when we, we celebrate our God, how he's blessed us. So Thanksgiving week's coming. Go ahead, if you haven't made that move, go ahead and text baptism at RCC to 
three, five. And let's go ahead and make plans for that. And if you're not going to be here that weekend, we can do it anytime. We're open up 24-7, okay? When I see those things, man, it fires me up. And my joy level goes up and it revs up. But let me tell you right now, it's, it, joy is not based on the circumstances of your life. That's not what dictates the level of joy in your life. So I, wanna, I want to give you right now, kind of open up simply a theology, a study on God and joy, all right? So if you have your bulletins, go ahead and write this down. Number one is this, and that is God, our Lord Almighty, is the most joyful being in the universe. You ever thought about that? God's the most joyful being in the universe. Walt Disney says that this is the happiest place on earth in Disney. I think about Kelly Ripa when she was with Regis and Kelly, remember that? I thought she's the most bubbly person on the planet. Well, guess who the most joyful being in the universe is? Our God, the Lord God Almighty. And joy is at the heart of God's plan for human beings because joy is at the heart of God himself. Our daily Bible reading, we land on this amazing verse in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. And here's what it says. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Say that with me. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now say it like you mean it. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And many people need to understand that there is strength and joy. And when you don't have joy, you've got weakness. And when you've got weakness, that leads us away from a genuine joy in the Lord into a pursuit of cheap, earthly thrills and unsatisfying worldly pleasures. I think about what the psalmist said when he said, say these words, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with what, church? You will fill me with what? joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Joy is central to the character of our God. Yes, God also knows sorrow, but just like sorrow and just like anger, they're temporary responses to a fallen world and the sorrow will be banished forever and ever from his heart when God sets this world right. Joy will be with him forever, and that's our destiny. Joy is our destiny through Jesus Christ. Here's the second thing about joy, and here it is. Jesus came as the ultimate joy giver. He came as the ultimate joy giver from the very beginning of his time. At his birth, we're going to celebrate this in a couple of months, all right? Holidays are coming around. Jesus, at his birth, the angels profess these things about Jesus. They say, I bring you good news that will cause great what? Will cause great joy for all the people. Jesus' first miracle was an event, one of the most joyful events that we ever participate in, a wedding. At the wedding, he turned water into wine. He kept the party going on. And he promised his disciples that their faithfulness, look at this, he promised them that their faithfulness rewarded and there'll be a joyful celebration for all eternity when he stated these words right here. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's what? Happiness. The greatest evidence, here it is, the greatest evidence of, for me that joy was at the core of our Lord and Savior was in his darkest hour. In his darkest hour, the time when he was being betrayed, he, he just, he brought up joy. Joy, he wasn't talking about what he was going to go through. He brought up joy. The joy that his death and his resurrection was going to bring his disciples and those who believe their message. Look what he says in John 15. This is when he's, when he's going to give his life away. This is the, that same night. He says this, I have told you this so that my what? My joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The same, same, basically, speech that he's giving goes all the way to the next chapter it says this in John 16 very truly I tell you you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices you will grieve but your grief will turn to what your grief will turn to joy a woman giving birth to a child has pain I bet she does <laughs> because her time has come but when her baby is born she forgets she forgets the anguish over time because of her what joy that a child is born into this world so with you he says so with you now is your time of grief but I will see you again and you will what you will rejoice and no one will be able to take away your what joy and then he prays at the end of that speech he's talking to his disciples he prays to God and here's what he prays to God for you and for me here's what he says I am coming to you now he's talking to God but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they talking about us may may have the full measure of my what of my joy within them Jesus is the ultimate joy bringer 
Another takeaway, number three, is God's intent for his creation is to mirror his joy. He wants his creation to mirror his joy. I mean, one person said this, if we only had one star glimmered in the night sky, we would stare at it, we would study it, we'd probably sing songs about it, like twinkle, twinkle, only star, you know, we would sing songs if there's only one star. But God created vast, look at this, God created vast constellations to brighten the darkness. So many stars we hardly notice. If God wanted to, he could have created a drab, bland, colorless world, all black and white with shades of gray. He could have created only one variety of fish and only one variety of fruit and only one variety of flower. He could have made only one type of animal or one type of style or one type of taste or one type of smell or one type of sound. But from rosebuds to peacock tails, God delights our eyes, he says, with extravagant color, doesn't he? It's a beautiful world we live in. Think about it. He not only gave... Noah, a sign of his covenant promise between his people, between God and, and his people, but he did it with flair. He put a rainbow in the sky. He, he doesn't just give the Israelites manna to eat. He, like, gives them frosted flakes. He makes it honey-flavored, all right? He doesn't just give Solomon ordinary lumber to build the temple. He gave him a fragrant cedar logs to fill the house of worship with aroma. The Lord didn't just feed a multitude of a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread. He gave them so much food that they ate till they were satisfied and there was plenty of leftovers. He doesn't just forgive our sins, he lavishes his grace on us. He doesn't just answer our prayers, he does immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. Yes, God could have created every person exactly the same. But instead, he gave each one of us designer genes, right? So we would, so we would leave, each one of us would leave our finger and fate prints on, on everything that we touched. He created visionary leaders that help us dream, funny characters that help us laugh, serious thinkers that help us discern. He created gentle calmers like my wife that give security. And everything God created, we see a mirror of his joy. The fourth thing I want to talk about when it comes to joy, and this is it, in every new creation in Jesus Christ causes heaven to rejoice. Every new creation in Jesus Christ causes heaven to rejoice. I love Luke chapter 15. It talks about lost things, all right? Because I'm always losing something, all right? So I love Luke 15. I identify, like, where's my iPod? Where's my sunglasses? Where's my cell phone? I mean, he talks about three things. I lost a coin, uh, I lost sheep, and I lost son. And each one of these things in Luke 15, something of value is lost, but was found. And when something of value is found, there's serious rejoicing going on in heaven. All right, in Luke chapter 15, look what it says. Jesus says, I tell you, there is what? There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. That's why every time someone gets baptized, when they give life to God, we go, you know what? Heaven is breaking out in a party right now. And that's not an exaggeration. I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels, oh, uh, angels of God over one sinner, one sinner who does what? One sinner who repents repents. You want to cause a party in heaven? Here's how you do it. You repent. You say, you know what? I'm going my way. Nope. Now I'm going the Lord's way. I'm God of my life. No, actually Jesus is Lord of my life. It's all about me. No, it's all about the kingdom. When you repent, I'm telling you right now, heaven rejoices. And that, sound, that sounds strange, doesn't it? I mean, you know, you want a party in heaven, repent. Many people, think about it, many people repent after a party, don't they? Not before it. But the Bible tells us the kingdom of God operates the opposite. You repent before the party starts. You, you see, we don't, we don't turn to Jesus to terminate the celebration. We turn to Jesus to initiate the celebration. We don't go to the party to look for Jesus. We go to Jesus and the party finds us. Amen? That's how it goes. So here it is, the joy, this idea of joy, joy is not an option in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. You ever thought about that? Joy is not an option in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul, who's in prison, right, I don't know what kind of bad day you're having or bad season you're having, but you're probably not in prison. This guy who's in prison, look what he writes. While he's in prison, rejoice in the Lord. Sometimes, how often? Always. 
<laughs> Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Read with me, church. Rejoice. Joy is a command. Did you know that? You know joy is a command? That, that, that means being joyless is being disobedient is what that means. But I, I would have to say to you it's probably the most tolerated disobedience in, in the church. People get all riled up about certain things. I think God gets upset when we're joyless. You ever seen Christians? I mean, a lot of times Christians look like they've been baptized in lemon juice or something. I mean, they walk around, they all pity party all the time. Not too many people get kicked out of a church for being joyless. Nobody's a recipient of church discipline for being a Debbie Downer, right? I've never seen that. I've never seen anybody go, hey, sourpuss, man, cut it out. You're taking the life out of the party, man. Why don't you go hit the road? I've never seen anybody do that in church. In most churches, let's be honest, they're somber institutions. One person said, he wrote, the bland lead the bland, is what he said. See, the greatest argument for Christianity is Christians. It's their certainty, it's their joy, it's their confidence in Jesus. But the greatest arguments against Christianity are Christians. When Christians are somber and joyless and self-righteous and smug and repressive, Christianity dies a thousand deaths. Here's the good news. Are you ready for some good news? Here's the good news. You ready? You can become a joyful person. You can become a joyful person. With God's help, nothing's impossible. And some of you are saying, Pastor, how can you say that? Some people are just more expressive, right? They just have a personality. I'm not talking about how people express joy. That's going to look different based on people's predispositions, people's giftedness, people's you know, personalities. I'm talking about the possibility of the presence of joy in your present reality whatever your circumstances may be. I'm talking about that kind of joy. And as we've already stated, joy is a command in the Bible, and God would not command us to do something if we did not have any control over it. Joyfulness is a learned skill, but you've got to take responsibility for your joy development. It's not your spouse's responsibility, by the way. Your joy development is not your parents' responsibility. It's not your boss's responsibility. Your joy development is not your kids' or your friends' responsibility. Your joy is your responsibility. So I want you to repeat after me. Here it is. Here's, here's what I want you to repeat. My joy is my responsibility. All right? Say that with me. My joy is my responsibility. One more time to mean it. My joy is my responsibility. It's not anybody else's. Now listen, you may be joy impaired. Try to be politically correct here. You may be joy challenged, okay? But you can do this. So if you're sitting next to someone right now, tell them, say to them, we can do this. Go ahead, person next to you, we can do this. Say it to them. We can do this. We can do this. And some of you are going, well, how do you do that? How are you, how you, how you going to do this, Pastor? Step one, here it is, ready? Step one, start today. Start today. The first step in pursuing joy is start right now. Look what Scripture says. Psalmist says, this is a day. This is a day the Lord has made. We will what, church? We will what? Rejoice and be glad in it. He doesn't say that yesterday was the day of the Lord. And, you know, I had it going on back then. He didn't say tomorrow is the day of the Lord and I'm just holding on for dear life by my fingernails to get to tomorrow. He says, no, this is the day, not tomorrow, not yesterday. This is the day with all of its shortcomings, with all of its stresses, this is the day that we experience joy. We often get sucked into the illusion that joy will come someday when my circumstances to life are going to change, right? We think, you know what? While we're in school, many students are thinking this, man, if I could just graduate, then I'll be joyful. And then, and then we graduate, right? And then we're single, and we go, man, if I can just be married, man, I'll be joyful. And then we get married, and then, you know, man, we're in our marriage, like, man, if I could just have kids, if I could just have children, then I'll be joyful. And then we have children. And then we start thinking, man, if the kids will just leave the house, I can be joyful. There were three people arguing about, you know, when's life begin? Like, when's life begin? One guy uh, said, I believe life begins at conception. 
The second guy says, well, I believe life begins at birth. The third guy says, I believe that life begins when the last kid leaves the house and the cat dies. All right? That's when the... No amens on that, huh? No amens. You know, I, this is a day the Lord has made, the scripture says. And if we're going to know joy, it has to start today. And some of you are asking the question, Pastor, how in the world can I experience joy through all the pain and all the suffering that's going on in the world? You would even ask this more personalized question like, is it even right? Is it even right to be joyful in a world with hunger and violence and such great injustice? You know, one of the most surprising things about joy is this to me. One of the most surprising things about joy is that people who are often the closest to suffering have the most profound sense of joy. Have you noticed that? The people who are closest to suffering have the most profound sense of joy. I know people right now, if you saw them, you're like, oh, of course they're happy because they got everything. They got, they got the husband and they got the great, you know, house and all that. You have no idea what they've been through. You have no idea the hell they've been through. And it doesn't matter their circumstances because their joy doesn't come from their circumstances. It doesn't matter if they're rich or they're poor. Their joy comes from the Lord. I think about Mother Teresa said that rather than being overwhelmed by the immense suffering, because she was surrounded by suffering around her, it, it, she said, I glow, I glow with joy. And she, as she went about her ministry of mercy to the poorest of poor. Oftentimes, the people closest to suffering have the most profound sense of joy. Listen to me. Joy, true joy, comes only to those who have devoted themselves to something that is greater than their own personal happiness. True joy comes to people who, gra- who have devoted themselves to something greater than it's all about me. And I don't know about you, but what keeps me mostly from experiencing joy in my life is my constant preoccupation with Nathan with myself. The selfishness that keeps me from noticing and delighting in the countless gifts that God provides for me each and every day. Family, listen to me. If we wait, if we wait till conditions are perfect, then we'll, we'll be waiting till we die to be joyful. So this is the day the Lord has made, and we will what? We will rejoice and be glad in it. Start today. Number two, if you want to get joy, here's what you need to do. You need to get in community. Find a joy mentor. There are people in our lives that bring us joy, right? I mean, there's people. I got a buddy in college. I said to him not too long ago, man, you are good for me. You are good to me. There are people in our lives. We know the joy of the Lord is their strength. And we need to bring those people in our life. We need, to, we need to allow them to breathe life into us, to energize us, to inspire us. Why is that so important? Let's be honest, because we know a lot of people who suck the joy out of us, right? We got people in our life, we talked about this last week. They're not joy givers, they're joy takers. And, and they just, they're, they're people who've rejected joy in their lives, and they have decided to be victims they decide they're going to be victim all the time, and what was me, and, 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 and they're going to blame you, and they're going to complain to you, and criticize you, and everything else, because that's why I'm not joyful right now, because of this and that. And they don't want you to be joyful either. They're like relational black holes. There was a lady who was well known for her faith in her neighborhood, and she would wake up every morning on her porch, and she would just yell out at the top of her lungs, praise the Lord, God is good all the time, and all the time. God is good. Well, next door to her was a grumpy atheist. All right? And he would shout out at her, stupid woman, there is no God. <laughs> next morning, she, she comes out and she would do that. And a month later, you know, she just kind of, she's going through a difficult time. And she just yelled out at, at her front porch, praise the Lord, God is good all the time. And God, I'm in need. I'm in need right now of some food. And God, if you could provide some groceries for me. Lord, I would appreciate it. Well, the next morning she wakes up and she walks out on her porch and there's a large bag of groceries right there on her porch. And she's like, praise the Lord, God, you provided again. Thank you, God, for providing for me and watching out for me. Or her atheist neighbor jumps out of the bushes right there. And he's like, aha, God did not provide that. I put those on your, your porch. God did not bring those to you. I'm the one who paid for those groceries and placed them on your porch. I'm the one who did it. And all of a sudden, the old lady just started jumping up and down. She got more excited than ever. She said, praise the Lord. You not only sent me groceries, Lord, but you made the devil pay for them. (laughs) 
I like that woman. That's my kind of girl right there. You know, we all got neighbors like that. We got people like that neighbor, don't we? There's somebody in our life, man, they're always, they're always, you know, being so negative to us. And we have to endure some joy, you know, draining people in life. We need to love them the best we can, but we got to set boundaries. We can't allow them to overly influence us. We need to identify some few people, some few people who can be joy mentors in our life, especially if we tend to be, let's be honest, if we tend to be joy impaired. Find someone that you can tell the joy of the Lord is their strength and tell them you're seeking to break free of your joy-impaired state and begin to meet with them, begin to pray with them and allow the joy from them to permeate your life in great abundance, all right? Find a joy mentor. Number three is this, celebrate. We need to be celebrating. Well, celebrate what? We need to be celebrating the little things. (laughs) Celebrate the little things, man. Hey, eat some foods you love to eat. Now, I understand you don't want to eat too much of some of those foods, but every now and then, we just got to have some Alfredo sauce. That's what I'm saying. And we just got to do that every now and then. Rachel, one time after a tough day, went to our pantry. She opened up the pantry. She looked in. I remember, never forget, I was sitting in the living room and heard her yell. (laughs) She said, she said, we need some chocolate in this house. And I was like, that's truth right there. That's truth. We do. Listen to music you enjoy, man. I was, I was pulling up today. I heard one of my brothers pull up, listen to some fun music in his car. I thought, that's, that's good stuff right there, man. Play some sports that refresh you. Read books that, that challenge you. Wear clothes, man, you, that make you happy. Put on stretchy pants when you eat the holiday meals in a couple of months. Man, loosen up a little bit, all right? As you do these things, give thanks for his wonderful gifts. I love what James, the brother of Jesus, says. Look what he says. Every good and every perfect gift is from where? It's from above. It's from above, coming down from the Father. Reflect on a gracious God that we have, that he's given us all these little gifts. Take the time to experience them. Take the time to savor them. Turn our heart to God. Appreciate the giver more than we appreciate the gifts. I think about Paul, who wrote to Timothy these words. And look what he said right here. He says, uh, he says to Paul, he says, through Timothy, can't command those in your church, Timothy, who are rich. And by the way, you go, well, I'm not rich. I can take you to places around the world that you realize you are rich. If you got running water, you're rich. You got hot water, you're really rich. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in what? Don't put your hope in wealth which is so uncertain but to put their hope in who god who richly provides us with everything for our what everything for our say it enjoyment everything for our enjoyment you need to celebrate you need to enjoy the little things how about this one right here unplug for a little while unplug i mean the bible talks about fasting taking a break from things i think if jesus were alive now what he would unplug from is technology i think he would fast from technology I read a stat back in February of this year that we spend on average five to six hours every single day on our cell phones. That's a quarter of our life. That's amazing. There was a a newspaper in Detroit that challenged people, 120 families, I'll give you $500 a couple of decades ago, I'll give you $500 to go a whole month fasting from TV. Believe it or not, out of the 120, 93 out of the 120 declined the offer. I'm like, what would you do? I could take that $500 and do something with it. But the, but the 27 families that actually took on the challenge said that their lives significantly, not a little bit, significantly improved by not watching TV, but immediately returned to their normal viewing habits once they got their money. I've never heard anyone say, man, I watch TV from the morning news all the way to late night talk show, and man, do I feel rejuvenated, refreshed, revitalized. I've never heard anybody say that. Technology prevents intimacy. It just kind of, it disrupts our connection with God and with each other. Try something radical. Unplug for a little while. And do something that you need to do that you've been refraining from doing. Find something life-giving. And you go, well, how in the world can me unplugging bring joy? One society, one guy said about our society, he says, our society is a culture complaint. It's a culture complaint. Well, why is that? We're constantly told that what we have isn't enough. And the, the primary communicator of this is social media, TV, technology. We're told we need something newer, something better, something 
bigger. And the media assaults our senses with expert design stimuli that causes us to want to consume more. Get ready for a whole bunch of holiday deals in a couple of months that you just can't pass. And when we realize we can't get everything or afford everything or afford what we did purchase, we get depressed. And you cannot feel joyful when your basic attitude is being discontent. You can't be joyful when you're discontent. And somehow we've got to untangle ourselves from this society that has an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. And we've got to find joy in God's presence who has eternal pleasures at his right hand. Well, how do we do that? Here's what we do. We focus on this. Whatever's true and whatever's noble and whatever's right and whatever's pure and whatever's lovely and whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, the what church think think about such things which leads us to the last point here it is we need to keep the big picture in mind we need to keep the big picture in mind to, to a large extent joy flows from a certain type of thinking the biggest battle you're going to have is not politics it's not another country it's not money it's right here between the ears the biggest battle you got is six seven inches right here it's your thinking. And see, everything that happens are filtered through what we believe what is happening or why something's happening. Our beliefs, hear me, our beliefs help us interpret events and determine our response to those things. Now, I believe this is why in the Old Testament you see this impressible theme of joy all through the New Testament believers. Because the New Testament writers, they were not engaging in some type of positive thinking. They were engaging in what's called eschatological thinking. Eschatological comes from the word eschatology. Eschatology means end times. They were thinking about the end times. They were thinking about the resurrection of Jesus and the final return of Jesus, meaning that, you know what, at the end, guess what? We win. We win in the end. Now, I got a little confession to make. If I realize my favorite team is losing, I will watch the game. But if I see that they won the game, I'll go back and watch the replay. Why? Because like when it goes down, like when things go south, I know we win. And I can watch the times when it goes south with a whole different set of eyes. I'm like, well, this is going to be interesting. How's this going to pull out? I tell you what, that's how the New Testament thinkers were thinking. They were like, we win in the end. So even though our circumstances aren't ideal, we're on the winning team. They kept the big picture in mind. And to emphasize this, I want to tell you a story about a wedding from Robert Fulgham. And let me warn you. It's gross, all right, it's gross, but it kind of proves the point about keeping the end in mind. The wedding, he says, included an 18, this is like a lavish wedding, 18-piece brass and wind ensemble, 24 bridesmaids and groomsmen, along with the pedal throwers and ring bearers, everything was working well and going according to plan until the climactic moment of the processional, the bride. Fulgham writes, all the bride. <clears throat> She had been dressed for hours, if not days. <laughs> no adrenaline was left in her body. And some of you brides know how that, how that feels, let alone with her father in reception hall of the church as the March of the Maidens went on and on and on and on. She walked to the tables of the gourmet goodies and absentmindedly sampled the pink and green mints. And then she picked through the bowls of mixed nuts, followed by a cheese ball or two. And then she ate some black olives, some glazed almond sausage, and a couple of shrimps, blanket and bacon. To wash that all down, a glass of pink champagne that her father gave her to kind of calm her nerves. And, and what you noticed as the bride stood in the doorway was not her dress, but her face. Her face was white. For what was coming down the aisle, Roberts wrote, was a live grenade and the pen pulled out. And then it happened. The bride threw up just as she walked by her mother. And when I say threw up, I don't mean a lady-like burp into a napkin. He says, she puked. There's no other word for it, he says. She hosed the front of the stage, hitting two bridesmaids, one ring bearer, the groom, and even the pastor. Only two people were smiling. The mother of the groom, that's pretty funny right there, and the father of the bride. 
Volgum explains how they pulled themselves together for a quieter, smaller, smaller private ceremony reception hall later on. The groom held the bride during the smaller ceremony and even kissed her. Now that's the really disgusting part to me right there. This is the best part, though. The best part of the story is this. He writes that 10 years later, everyone was invited back to celebrate the epic wedding disaster. The mother bride had hired three video cameras to catch every angle of this matrimonial train wreck. And they all watched the whole thing from beginning to end. And the party was thrown by none other than the mother of the bride. How could these people rejoice, all right? How could these people rejoice when everything had gone so wrong? Here it is. Despite all the mess, the bride still got the groom at the end of the day, and that's all that mattered. That's all that mattered. And, and here, and you're asking, well, how is it possible to be a joy-filled person in a pain-filled world? Look at the promise that comes at the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 19. Here it is. Let us what, church? Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride, the church, has made herself ready. You see, family, no matter what happens in this crazy, messed up, wounded world, one day, heaven's groom is going to get his bride. One day, Jesus is coming back, and he's going to reclaim us all back home with him. And the joy that is in store for God's people is so great that the only image that can do it justice is the joy between a lover and his beloved. And then we will see the wedding in which the greatest weddings on earth have only been a dim foreshadowing of. And then God is going to dance with his people. And joy will reign undisturbed and uninterrupted. And the joy of the Lord, church, is going to be our strength forever and ever and ever. Amen. Will you stand with me? Will you stand with me? Let's go to God in prayer. I want to pray over you right now as we close. Father God, we come before you. And Lord, there's people in this room who don't feel it's possible to be joyful. Lord, they, they, their, their circumstances are just not ideal. Their, their health issues, their relational issues, Lord, right now, their, their financial problems, Lord, their family, the addiction they're dealing with, Lord, it's just, it's just such, a, it's such a ball and chain right now, God. And they don't believe that they can be joyful. And Lord, I'm praying right now for you to melt their heart through Jesus Christ, for them to even see a glimmer of hope that, Lord, they can be joyful. And it's a command. And a man in a prison said, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Lord, it is possible. Even them, even every single one of us can be joyful. So, Lord, right now I'm praying for us to even have the faith to start the process. Lord, even to say to ourselves, I can be joyful. I can be joyful. I can be joyful. Lord, right now I'm asking you to remove all the barriers and allow us right now to walk in obedience, but choosing joy right now, whatever the circumstances are, but maybe realize it doesn't come, the joy does not come from us, the joy comes from you. So Lord, we depend on you, we lean in you, and now Lord, the Spirit fills us up, and may that joy over, overflow right now in every aspect of our life. We pray this in the name of our Son, Jesus Christ. Everyone said, Amen. If there's anything that could be a blessing, I want you to put on that card. There's people in the front rows that would love to pray for you. You can go to the cross. Maybe today you want to give your life. Say, you know what? I'm choosing joy today. Wherever it is, why don't you come right now as we worship God. And we just sing about the house of the Lord having some joy. Amen. Let's give God the praise right now.
heal. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're Hey, real quick, I want you to know something. Steph looks really good today with the RC shirt, doesn't he? He looks incredible. He does. Hey, we want you to look this good, too. we got a apparel sale happening this week and next week and end. So go ahead and see Mark out there for apparel sale and get those RC shirts. Hey, great idea to buy that crazy uncle of yours in Wisconsin, RC hat. You can do it now for Christmas, all right? Hey, I want you to know something. I have a little bit of a family meeting right now. I want you to know something, RCC, I found at Scrubbles at the car wash place right here in Fleming Island. Notice this photo right here. There's some magnets that have fallen off at Scrubbles, all right? Two things. One is you guys love your car clean. That's great. But you need another magnet, all right? So go out there and grab a magnet at the Welcome Center, put it on your car. Grab another one, put it on somebody else's car too while you're at it. And let's share the love of Jesus with other people in our community. And lastly, we have the Fall Festival happening right here on our campus. We want to give you a card as you're walking out. Take that card and give it to someone else. Take it to a waitress, give it to a neighbor, give it to a family member, and let's get the community on our campus on October 24th to celebrate the season. Amen? And so let's do that. RCC, know this, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Can we give God the praise for his joy that comes from him? He's a good God. Our seat, we love you. God's working through you. Go change the world. We'll see you soon.